everybody, and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Back with another news video, and boy, do we have some juicy stuff to get to in this one. We have some small filming news, some more hype for the hype train, a short video release from the production, and a dynamite Q&A from Rafe Judkins, the showrunner for the Wheel of Time. I'm excited to get to everything, but before that, I want to mention that this video is sponsored by ShopWheelOfTime.com the merchandise store for thegreatblight.com. You can get all things Wheel of Time there, and if you are Christmas shopping, now is the time to place your order to get stuff by Christmas. I especially recommend any of the art by Corey Lansdell you can find on the store. Stay tuned to the end of this video, and I will give you a coupon code that you can use in the store to get a special discount. Now, let's hit the spoiler warning for today's video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red, meaning there will be major spoilers running all the way through The Great Hunt. If you have not read the second book in the series, hold off on watching this video until you have. So we have a lot of things to get to today, so let's kick it off with this photo posted by Alvaro Morte. Now, Alvaro, the actor cast to play Logan Ablar in the show, uh, posted a picture on Instagram of himself in the city of Segovia. Now, this information comes courtesy of the Instagram account run by Watch and Find Out. They are claiming that he is in the town of Segovia filming at the castle that we previously reported on that is in Segovia, Spain, Alcazar Castle. Now, we only knew that there would be some sort of battle being filmed there, but this appears to uh, tell us that this will be Gildon and that this is Loghain's castle. And perhaps this is the capture of Loghain if he is involved in this scene. Not a ton to go on here. I'm curious what you guys think of that. Is this Loghain? Uh, is this castle where he's being captured? Now moving on to our next bit of news. We have the entire buildup and then release of a short clip from the production team followed by a Twitter Q&A with Wheel of Time showrunner Rafe Judkins, where he answered all kinds of prop and set design questions, which are really cool, some very exciting stuff. Let's start with the lead up to this, though. It all started with Sarah Nakamura posting fleets on Twitter, talking about her being excited for something that she couldn't talk about yet. Now, we don't know that this release that we got later was what she was excited about, but she was certainly excited about the release. Then the day before the release, the Wheel of Time on Prime Twitter handle tweeted out a tweet just saying, Wednesday approaches with a sword emoji next to it. Now this of course had built quite a bit of hype from the fan base. We were expecting some sort of release on a Watt Wednesday from Amazon. So then Amazon releases a short video. Now we're gonna break it down, but let's go ahead and show it again, just in case you missed it or you wanna watch it for the 4,000th time. So this is actually my 4,001th time watching this uh, video now, so I'm going to break it down a little bit. Now, obviously, this video is showing the concept, design, and production of a heron-marked sword. Uh, given the emphasis on this particular sword and the caption, I think we can venture to say that this is probably Tam's heron-marked sword that he gives to Rand. Now, the Watt on Prime Twitter handle also tweeted a follow-up saying, book, sketch, design, build and on set, showing the progression through the video. Now, I think this is the type of thing that gets me personally very excited because I'm a firm believer that the little things and the attention to detail in production, like the prop and set design, are really what add to making a show feel immersive. I think back to shows like Rome on HBO, obviously Game of Thrones. These are shows where everything that they put into this, building the sets, building the props, really made those shows feel very immersive. The fact that they have a process that they have mentioned for turning the things from the book into reality has me very reassured as a fan. So let's talk about this particular prop. I absolutely love the design. It's simple, it's not ornate or anything, but it's exactly how I pictured it. Now I've seen some people mentioning that there isn't a heron on the hilt, and that's a valid point as Tam's sword did have a heron on both the hilt and on the blade. So it's an interesting choice to leave it off of the handle set of the sword itself, but I also don't think it's a big deal and I think it looks great. For those of you who are wondering how they're gonna do Rand burning a heron into his hand at Falma, I'm sure there's all kinds of ways to pull that off that don't involve him just having his hand on the hilt. We're gonna come back to this topic because Rafe sort of addresses it later. I've also seen some people talking about this particular sword being lands possibly and not rands 
uh, or maybe even Turox Blade. Now, I don't think this is the case for two reasons. First of all, the written description at the beginning of the video is the exact written description from the book describing Tam's sword. So yeah, that's probably that. Second of all, Land Land's sword, even though he's a blade master and it's power rot, does not have a heron on the blade or on the hilt. It's just a plain sword. So I'm fairly certain that this is meant to be Tam's sword. Let me also quickly address the music playing during the video. I know some have asked and speculated that this music is written for the show. It's actually a song called Protectors of the Earth by Two Steps from Hell. It's a really cool song, and we'll come back to the music later because Rafe actually discussed it in his Q&A. And the last thing before we move on and hit on that Q&A, I've seen some people that were frankly a little disappointed that we didn't get something bigger or some type of a release or announcement that was more than just seeing props. And I can totally understand that to a degree. I think we were all super excited maybe getting our hopes up for a trailer or a major announcement like a release date. Um, I think it's okay to be disappointed because we still are waiting, but also still be super excited at the same time and be really happy with what we are getting. I personally get very excited about production design and especially those types of announcements, because to me, they're super interesting. And like I said, they give me a glimpse of how they're making the show and the level of detail that they're going into, which has me pretty excited, as you can see. Uh, to me, it was exciting, but I understand to some people that that's not, that doesn't get you fired up quite as much. The best thing that I can say to you is they're going to be releasing more. We are getting closer and closer to the show. They are not required to give us anything. And the fact that they make and put the time and effort into making these teasers, showing us the prop and set design uh, is awesome to me. We're going to get a chance to see more and more and more as we get closer to the show. They actually said it. Um, if you paid attention, I'll mention this later, but Sarah said be patient. And so here's my, my best advice to you is, is if you were not thrilled with that, I was. But if you weren't, be patient. It'll come. Don't worry. It'll come. So let's move on and talk about that Q&A. Now, Rafe Judkins, in announcing the video itself, also gave fans the chance to ask him 10 questions about production and set design. We're going to go through each one of the questions one by one and look at his answers, and I'll give you my thoughts on each of them. So the first question Rafe answered was from our good friend, Geeky Eerie, who asked, what balance are you striking between recording what's in the books word for word and letting the artists have creativity? And Rafe's answer was, what's really important to me is that when we're diverging from the books that we know we're doing it. So every piece of production design from the shoes to the swords to the white tower itself begins with the pages of quotes from the books about that place or thing. The designer then takes it from there to build something that makes sense in our own world with our production concerns, our cast and our aesthetic, etc. But at the end of the day, it all stems from the first document and that's something that we always go back to. So I like what Rafe is saying here. Uh, in other words, what he's saying is, is if we're gonna make a change, we're going to be doing it on purpose, and we have a reason to do it. There may be some things that are not as practical on screen as they are on the page. Perhaps the lack of the heron on the handle uh, is one of those deliberate changes. Maybe it's harder to hold, or a sword expert said that wouldn't work. I I'm not a sword expert, I wouldn't know. But I do love that they are looking at the books for descriptions at first, and obviously it would be dumb not to, given how descriptive Robert Jordan was. Another thing I love here is I can't wait to see the White Tower. Rafe mentions that its design comes from the books, which implies that they have designed the White Tower, which could mean that we might likely see it in season one, considering we don't see the White Tower until book two. This either means that we get all or some of book two, as has been speculated, or we get additional tower scenes uh, just inserted in. Either way, I'm really excited to see what Tarvalin and the White Tower look like in general. The second question comes from Nakomi, who asked, have you filmed any of the pre-production design, manufacturing of props, etc., for a behind-the-scenes program? I have to say, I really hope so. And I agree, Nakomi. I really hope so. And so Rafe answered, of course, an amazing team has been picking up as much as they can of the process. So after the show's aired, you can see all the work and love that went into creating these details, large and small. Well, first of all, again, great question, Nakomi. Uh, and Rafe's answer essentially confirmed that they have a separate crew filming the behind the scenes for either a Blu-ray collection or a special features episode or just kind of behind the scenes stuff. This is fairly common with larger productions to hire a second crew to film the whole process. And I'm super excited for that. I love seeing behind the scenes talk. I typically watch it for any shows or movies that I can. I love the interviews and perspectives from those making the show happen. I wouldn't be shocked if we saw interviews with Brandon Sanderson, with you know, Maria, Harriet, all the actors. That's the type of stuff I love. 
Um, so I'm excited for that. The third question comes from Meso, who asks, since we're on the topic of swords, what are some of the inspirations for armor design? Is there quite a bit of variation between the Andoran and Shinaran armor? Rafe answered, yes, our costume team, led by the amazing Isis Mutsenden, started building a map of the entire Wheel of Time world, carving out what each nation and culture looked like to make sure that they're differentiated and honoring what's in the books and then diving back into the two rivers. Again, I love Rafe's answer here. I love that the overall philosophy was to build out the entire world, kind of build the aesthetic for each culture, uh, and then kind of focus back in on a single one. That means that they're focusing on building out the world, which means that number one, they think they're gonna get a couple seasons to do that, which is positive, <laughs> but also that they're building a distinct cultural feel. Um, and I love that. Uh, the next question comes from Cold Witch, who asked, How do you decide what needs to be physically made, like a sword, and what's going to be effects? And Rafe answered, I want things to be as real as possible. So any, in any place we possibly can, we've built things instead of trusting to effects. Our show could be all green screen, all CGI, but I think you'd be surprised how much of it was actually built and touched and held by our actors. So this answer has me the most stoked of all of the answers. Uh, this was the question I asked, but Cold Witch beat me to it. Um, and I can't tell you how pumped I am to hear that they are going the practical effects route rather than making everything CGI. The level of realism that you get from practical effects is incredible. I think it gives a very tangible, real world feel to the show. The best example that I can point you to is the difference between Lord of the Rings, the original trilogy, and then the follow-up Hobbit trilogy. In Lord of the Rings, it was done almost entirely with practical effects where they could, and it looks so much better, and it holds up for being movies that are 20 years old. They hold up absolutely amazing. If you look at the Hobbit trilogy, which is almost entirely done with CGI, it looks like it was done with CGI. And although it's great CGI, it's not the same. So I really am a big proponent of practical effects. I love the fact this is the route they're going. I love the way that it looks. I cannot wait to see stuff. So that answer had me pumped. Question five comes from Mike Turner who asks, weapons and their individualistic characteristics are integral to particular characters, especially Matt, Rand, and Perrin. Will the show give a similar focus or will the weapons be mostly there? Rafe answered, you cannot even imagine the number of hours that goes into each person's weapon. I was in at least 20 meetings about the dagger that Egwene has, and that's not even a major weapon in the books. There's a whole team of people, and we have a few big book fans on the props team, looking at every time held by an actor on the show. I'd be shocked if less than 10,000 woman and man hours were spent on the design and creation of the Heron Marked Sword. Again, what I love here is the attention to detail with props and practical effects. The way that you can change the feel of a show is very palpable, in my opinion. The fact that the props team spends as much time as they do on these things demonstrates the level of detail elsewhere, and I'm very excited about that. The next question comes from Al Land Mandragoran himself, who asked, will there be different styles of swords and Heronmark swords, or will all of them be katana style? Now Rafe answered, many, many different styles. So this answer is fairly self-explanatory, and it's good to hear that the part of the cultural differentiation uh, they mentioned earlier will involve different looking weapons. Now, for those of you who are shocked to see that the Heronmark sword actually looked like a katana, that is exactly how it's described. Most of the swords that Blade Masters use in the Wheel of Time books are basically katanas or similar to it. Okay, that look. They are not big, you know, hilted broadswords. I'm certainly not a sword expert, but that is not how most of them are described. Uh, there are swords that are like that but most of them are that katana style. So the next question comes from Natro, who asks, Will Moraine still have a staff at the outset? I know she says it helps her to focus, but seeing as she, she just tosses it aside after it was charred coming out of the ways and never replaced it, uh, it doesn't really seem necessary. And Rafe's answer might be a bit controversial here. Uh, he said, We're approaching this as an adaptation of the entire series, not just each book individually. So hopefully season one will feel more like the entire book series worth of Wheel of Time than it does Eye of the World. With that in mind, no more Ain staff, let chaos ensued, ha. Now I know, I know some who are total purists, this may be something they don't like, but honestly it makes sense. Robert Jordan built this world as he went in the novels, 
and added to existing systems and rules and discarded other ones as he wrote. Moraine's staff is something that most new fans or most non-Wheel of Time fans might associate a little too closely with Gandalf from Lord of the Rings uh, and making Moraine sort of a female Gandalf. Uh, and I, I think considering she gets rid of it early on, it's better just to not have it. Uh, I think it's a good move. So with the next question, Jack Fogarty asks, how is the set for the two rivers designed architecturally? It would seem easy to make it homely or medieval, uh, but because of its location and history, are there other inspirations coming into play? And Rafe answered, when the books came out, they felt blazingly fresh and different and new. And we want the same thing to be true of the show. So if you see us leaning away from certain elements in the books, oftentimes it's because audiences have seen them before. Unfortunately, sometimes, even in cases where the book-to-screen adaptations are from the books, it cribbed from Wheel of Time. Ha. So to interpret Rafe, the Two Rivers design will probably not be the exact same in the books, and I think he explains himself fairly well, and probably explaining some other changes that we're going to see also. Regardless of whether the Wheel of Time did something first in the books, they need to make it a show that feels new and fresh to audiences, considering most people that are going to watch this show did not read the books. And keep in mind, again, the main audience they are going for here is people that didn't read Wheel of Time. And they want to bring in that wider audience. So they don't want it to feel the same as other shows that wider audience may have seen. I think it's smart. I think it completely makes sense. And I'm totally open to changes like that. Uh, that don't detract from the story, but are just differences in set design. For instance, not having thatched roofs or something like that. Again, easy thing to do. The next question comes from Lucky Mandragoran, and he asks the music. How is that related to the show? Did we just get a glimpse of the theme? And Rafe answers, this is not music from the show itself. Uh, when it is, I will make sure you know it, and hopefully it will feel very uniquely Wheel of Time. Again, we spoke about this earlier, that that song is from elsewhere, but I, for one, cannot wait to hear the Wheel of Time theme. I think about how much the Game of Thrones theme added to that show and how I hope that we really get something as iconic as that intro for the Wheel of Time. The last question comes from Kevin and he asks, how are the sword forms going to be presented? Is style going to be pulled from a specific region of sword fighting or are they going to spread it out over many different regions? Rafe answered, we have a fight time and sword master on the show who has built a fighting style unique to each weapon and culture. So if you see a Borderlander fight with a heron marked blade, it may feel very different than a Shan Chan. That's merely hypothetical, of course. Winky face. Okay, damn it, Rafe. I'm not sure whether to believe that the Shan Chan are a part of the story of season one here or not. Uh, this could be very well be true. Or it could be that just Rafe knows everybody's speculating that they're in season one and that season, you know, season one is going to be book one and two. He knows that and he is just messing with us. In regards to the question, this comes back to the attention to detail they are playing when it comes to all the small things. I love the fight styles. And if you remember the training that Daniel Henney said that they had to do to use the weapons from his Q&A months ago, this has me super excited for the fight choreography. So in general, I love when Rafe does Q&A sessions because they give us little glimpses of what we are getting with the show and the design philosophy uh, behind its creation. These people love Wheel of Time, and I feel like it's in great hands. Something Sarah Nakamura said on the Dusty Wheel the other night was also that we're going to be getting more and more of these little glimpses as the show comes closer and closer to release. So I am pumped, and again, all of you who were, uh, I, I don't think anybody was really upset or anything, but if you were slightly disappointed that you didn't get a trailer, that stuff's coming. Uh, they're giving it to us in pieces as it's ready. I'm just thrilled that we get anything because most shows don't do this at all. So I'm thrilled by this. What did you think of the video and the Q&A answers from Rafe? Please let me know in the comments below. Make sure to smash the like button as it helps YouTube promote this stuff with the algorithm. And early on, I mentioned a discount code for shopwheeloftime.com. The code I'm about to give you is only good for inactive for the next three days. So make sure to take advantage of it this weekend. If you head to shopwheeloftime.com and enter the code WHEELOFTIME, all capitals, at checkout, you're going to be getting 10% off your order. Make sure to hurry if you want to get the order in by Christmas. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time TV show and general Wheel of Time content. That's all I do here. I've got tons of old videos for you to watch as well, so take a look at those if you are new to the channel. Follow me on Twitter to see when I'm posting new videos or just making announcements, or when I post when I'm going live on Twitch, which is where I do most of my live streams now. We've been having a ton of fun over there, and it's a lot more interactive, and I have a lot more capabilities than I do on YouTube. 
You can follow my Twitch stream at twitch.tv forward slash Wattenablis. If you're brand new to Twitch, it's super easy. It's just like YouTube. You tune in and watch stuff and you chat. Uh, so just head there, follow me. You'll know when I go live. Join us for one. It's fun. Uh, we're going to be doing some game show stuff here coming up. It'll be a lot of fun. Also, make sure to check out the Patreon if you want to support the website and get early access to the maps that I've been making. We're working on the big Tarvalin map, and my god, this thing is gigantic. Uh, we're putting, like, each building in. Uh, you're going to like the Tarvalin map. If you want to see get early access and see the full-size versions of those, check there. That's always where they're going to be posted first. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. And until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?